That mic should be working, I believe. Well, I'm Pastor Clements. I'm the chaplain at Champions Cove, where Al and Dolores live. And I want to welcome you to this memorial. This is a celebration of Al going home. I can tell by the number of family <laughs> and friends that Al was much loved. He is a special man, a good Christian. He had made his decision to turn his life over to the Lord many years ago and worked tirelessly toward what God had placed upon his heart. And I know that I know in visiting with Al that he received the words well done, thy good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father God, I come before you and I lift this family. I pray, Father, that you comfort as only you can, that through this time there will still be joy in knowing exactly where Al is. Father, I ask that you meet each and every need within this family. And God, I pray that they will focus upon the good times. And if there be any bad times, Father, that they would fade out into the distance. God, I ask that you draw them closer to each other than ever before. And through this, that you will draw them closer to you. God, we give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. Uh, I'm Bob Stewart. I am Dolores' brother. And uh, Al was a great brother-in-law. So um, I have the privilege. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. We have some very important gentlemen in the back. They're okay. Come. Do it. Yeah. Call a presentation. Yes. Okay. Sorry.
armed forces in our country. It's fair winds and foul deceits that we promise to obey. Thank you, Madam Chief. Again, I say, Officer Lowry, who are sorry for your loss, may God be with you and your family at this time. Thank you very much as well for allowing us the opportunity to honor a real American hero like our brother, Petty Officer Colonel Frank Lowry. T-Bone Healy with the Patriot Guard Riders of North Texas. The men and ladies that are standing here with me today represent just a small part of the many tens of thousands of Patriot Guard Riders who volunteer to do this on a daily basis. When a family reaches out to us, we come out to support the family and to honor their loved one's service. We do this for the families of our active duty military, our military veterans, and our first responders. I'd like to thank you, Mike, and your family for inviting us to be here today. We're quite honored. <clears throat> I have this certificate of appreciation that I would like to present to your family. And it reads, on behalf of the Patriot Guard Riders, we offer our most sincere appreciation for this honorable service of Alvin Frank Rice, United States Navy Korean War veteran. Our deepest sympathy to you and your family for the loss of this American hero. It was an honor for us to be with you today to stand tall and silent in this memory. Presented on this 21st day of April in the year of our Lord, 2022. <laughs> I, I guess I should. I guess I should. So we'll try this again. I'm Bob Stewart, and I'm uh, Dolores' brother um, from Oregon. And uh, there's several of his uh, nephews that have traveled to Oregon uh, also, uh, or from Oregon, to be here today. And um, those of you that knew Al well knew that he was thoughtful, kind, and always had a plan. And part of that plan is that he wrote his own obituary. Fifteen years ago, he wrote his own obituary. <laughs> and I get the privilege of reading that, that obituary and then sharing a little bit about um, my experiences with Al. Um, because I think this was called uh, the big adventure or the great adventure, right? Uh, and that it was. That it was. This is a love letter to be shared, at least in part, with my family and friends at my funeral. I feel blessed by the Lord to have had such a wonderful life. As in every life, there are mountain peaks and valleys, and so it has been in mine. But in the whole, I have had wonderful family, friends, and experiences that have given meaning and joy to my life. As a youth, I grew up in a farming community where I learned the value of hard work, but also to enjoy the outdoors. It was not all work, but the joy of hunting and fishing, and generally to enjoy nature in all the seasons. Most people have at least one defining moment in their life where they made a decision that changed their direction or course they were on. I have identified four. 
such times in my life. Later on, there will be a life chart that will be displayed for you so you can see what that life chart looked like. Of course, there were many important events and happenings in my life that were the natural course of events. But these are what I call my defining moments. One, my first defining moment came in 1954 when I was in the Navy, serving during the Korean War in Japan as a machinist mate. I had to work on an engine on Thanksgiving Day to get it ready for flight later that day. The airplane was outside and I had to sit on top of the engine to do the job. It was snowing and I was cold and wet. I loved airplanes, being around them and working with them, but I came to the realization that if I wanted something better than this, I needed to go back to school. From that moment on, I decided to go to college to study aeronautical engineering. My second defining moment came when I surrendered my life to Christ in a small church in Long Beach, California in 1955. I was still in the Navy and my sister had taken me to that church on the weekends that I visited with her. That decision had a great impact on my life and altered the direction and my lifestyle beyond my imagination. Three, my third defining moment was when I proposed marriage to Dolores and she accepted. I had never really been serious with another girl, but I arrived at the conclusion that Dolores was the one that the Lord brought into my life and had arranged for me to marry. She has had a profound impact on me and we have had a wonderful 64 years of together. Did he write that before we were 65, or was it 64, Dolores? Um, we've had 65 anniversaries. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. My fourth defining moment was the realization that the Lord had something else for me other than being an engineer. I felt the strong pull to be full-time in his service. Dolores and I talked and looked for over a year until uh, were led to investigate working with Wycliffe Bible Translations. We joined with that mission and worked with them for 18 years. As I write this at age 75, so 15 years ago, I do not know where the end will come, but I know it will and must, but I want my life to have mapped a difference that I have been a blessing to some. Above all, the thing I pray for is that I've been an example of the Lord's grace and mercy and that I will have finished well. It has been my heart's desire that all of you have or will come into a personal relationship with Christ by accepting him as your savior and experience God's mercy and grace. So some of my experiences with Al um, were a lot of firsts. Uh, Al taught me to play chess. He also taught me that he could let me win <laughs> at chess. I had my first motorcycle ride with Al. It was on a freeway in Wichita, and it was fast. It was really fast. I remember at one point he leaned back over his shoulder and said, Bobby, that's what I was when I was 11. Bobby, don't hang on so tight, because my arms were wrapped around his waist. I had my first experience shooting a shotgun with Al, and I learned a valuable lesson. Hold it tight to your shoulder. I played my first tennis game on a clay tennis court with Al in Huntsville, Alabama. I had a ride on the brand new airport runway in Huntsville, Alabama. And I believe we were in Austin Healy. And the airport had not been opened yet, but the runways were in. And runways are really long, they're really straight, and they're really wide. And we were going well over 100 miles an hour. <laughs> so there were lots and lots of adventures over that time. When Dolores and Al got married, I was just a little guy. And so Al was like a big brother. 
and he was an example. And he was smart, and he was kind. And when they uh, made the decision to go to Wycliffe, I was a freshman in college. And that had a profound impact on me. That's when I decided to give my life to Christ at that time because of that impact. Al concluded his obituary by saying, may the Lord richly bless and keep you. I close with my favorite verse from Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto, upon your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. The last thing I'll tell you is the music that you heard tonight was also selected by Al. He had favorite hymns. And Dolores and my sister Joyce was on the piano tonight playing those hymns. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. So uh, just want to welcome everybody. We have a lot of folks, including Bob and his family, Diana, yeah, are all the way here from, from Oregon, and we appreciate all you guys coming down, including my cousins, who we refer to as the Giants, and you'll notice that walking them around, because they're the tallest people in the room. Jeremy, Brent, and his girlfriend, Ashley, Tyler, and Shane, and Meredith, you guys are in the back. New baby. Thanks for coming. Mom's new family at Champions Cove. Thanks for being here. You guys are an extension of the family now, coming right across from the street. And, of course, other family and folks, longtime friends here in Austin. Uh, appreciate you all being here. So over the last years, I mean, with COVID, it's been tough on a lot of us. Um, health issues, unemployment, all kinds of things in the future. And, you know, just in a show of hands, how many of you felt like, you know, it's been so unpredictable. The minute you stand up, you get knocked back down again. You stand up, you get knocked back down again. I'm going to ask Jonathan, <laughs> all our crew there for sure. Jonathan, can you switch to, I want to just a little clip just to kind of get this in a, a more kind of fun. Um, this is going to be a lot different service than what you're used to, I think. Uh, and so we're, uh, I saw this clip and I've watched it a hundred times and I laugh every time. And I think, you know, this, this was all of us over the last three years, right? Just when we were, you just, you can't give up, right? I laugh every time. It's so funny. And I think, I was that kid. I feel like that kid. Right? And um, so I'll let Jonathan start this back up again. Again, this service is really going to be a lot different, I think. And, uh, and I showed that clip. Um, that's okay. I can go from there. Um, so I play that clip because I feel that we've uh, kind of all been through a lot over the last few years, and we need to give each other grace and empathy as we're all trying to kind of find our feet again. And uh, I have to admit, a couple of years ago, we almost lost Dad to illness, uh, but he came out of it, and, and ever since then, I thought, you know, I've got to tell a story, but how do you tell a story about somebody who's lived 90 years. <laughs> and it's been such an interesting story. Um, and how you do Well, it's not going to be 30 minutes, so I hope you ask for the day off. <laughs> Good thing my boss is here because I told him I was taking the whole day. Did you tell your boss you were taking off, Dan? It's okay. It's going to be a little But I think some really interesting thing uh, um, about Al, in fact, uh, through Tori. Tori, you need to work your way up here. Tori, and there was a lot of this about, about Dad that uh, even I didn't know until uh, I started putting this together and I was digging the file 
You know, it's one of those things that unless you ask them a specific question, you don't know the answer, right? Um, Tori, our oldest daughter, uh, helped to put a lot of this together, and I, that mic is live, so you'll want to go talk over there. I see. You can move it down. <laughs> can I? Whatever, this is fine. Can you hear me, everybody? Hi. Um, so, as may some of you, most of you, may know, I'm in the film industry. I graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts at Stephen F. Austin State University with a cinematography degree. Um, the year I graduated, I bought a camera. And my dad said, I think it'd be cool if you did some sort of film about grandpa and him uh, going from being an engineer on the Apollo mission to becoming a missionary. And that's kind of hard to do. That's like a lot. Um, he, he's done so much in his life and it would be um, one, getting the rights for that NASA footage is not easy. But uh, I am still trying to get it put together, but um, I thought I had more time. Um, and I wanted it to be bigger. I wanted everybody to see it. I wanted the world to see it, and I wanted it to be put in theaters, and uh, I wanted to tell it right, and there's still questions I have for him. But I hope that this shows you a lot of, this is the most I've ever seen Grandpa talk in my life, actually. And uh, him and Grandma, actually, I know you food, both of you guys. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy it and you learn a lot about Grandpa you didn't know. So. Thanks, Tori. So, uh, again, even at Tori's interviews, she went with a couple of days out to Tyler and set up a couple of hundred questions. And, and a lot of those questions I had never asked, and a lot of the answers Dad gave I'd never heard. And so you're gonna see today. And so this is a story, a story I've been pondering and feverishly working on over the last uh, couple of weeks. A story of a young man and his family. A young man who had a vision, a vision to be more. More than a mechanic, more than an aeronautical engineer. It's about a young man who wanted to make an impact on the world, to change the course of mankind, to show compassion and forgiveness, and to sacrifice all of his, and by the way, all of his family's worldly possessions. <laughs> to pick up the cross and follow his Lord and Savior and to answer the Lord's calling to become a fisherman. No, not for bass masters, although I think we all know that professionally he would love to become a full-time fisherman, professionally. But rather, he and mom's passion to become Christ fishermen, fishermen of men's souls. We hope you enjoy the story. My name is Alvin Frank Rice. I was born in 1932 in a small town in Kansas called Leota. I grew up on a farm, and a matter of fact, I was born out in a farm, but not in a hospital. And a doctor came out and delivered me out in a farmhouse. And that was western Kansas. I was there until, oh, probably about 10, and we moved from western Kansas to just south of Woodstock, Kansas, in a little area called Clearwater. My sister and I, kind of grew up together. All the others were older and pretty much gone. My sister and I were closer, but then I was also close to my next brother, Edwin. He took me riding on his motorcycle, and so we had a lot of fun. But the one I was closest to was my brother, Herbert, because he came there after the war, kind of like a second father to me, because my father had died. After I graduated from high school, I worked for about a year as a machinist. But then I got to thinking, well, I want to do something more interesting than this. All my brothers had been in the military, so I decided to join the Navy. 
and uh, take an assignment somewhere else in the world and kind of see the world. And so that's what I did. Well, it was a four-year assignment when I first uh, started, and part of that would be a two-year uh, foreign assignment. And of course, in the, when I had the opportunity, I selected Japan. It was as a machinist mate working on airplanes I assigned to Japan because that was during the Korean War and a lot of airplanes came back damaged so we would work on getting those airplanes refitted and shipped back over to Korea. Well, J Japan was a kind of a fun place to be and there was a lot of different things to be involved in. And one thing on the base we could set up an archery range and I helped set up an archery range and I got into archery and uh, a number of the, the fellows that I worked with we um, all kind of shot archery together. Um, a couple of defining moments that Bob had talked about. Uh, obviously this is those on Thanksgiving Day in the Korean War where he decided that he needed to go back to college. The second one, the year later, when he accepted his, uh, accepted life, Christ in his life, that chart that Bob was talking about, Dad had sketched this thing out and I had to decipher it and, and kind of re-put it into to a slide that made some sense. But you can see early in life there was three pretty major defining moments in his life uh, in the Navy, two in the Navy, and then when he went back to Kansas and met mom and they got married. So the third defining moment in 1955. Started going to a church there, Church of God, which I was familiar with as part of before I went to the Navy. And uh, there were a lot of young people there. And so, uh, I started dating some of the other girls, but there was one cute little blonde. I can, I can remember him looking at me with his beautiful blue eyes across the church, and I looked at him, and that was all it took, really. Yes, uh, yeah. She was in charge of one of the youth programs one evening that I really got impressed with her because she was cute and, and bright. Aww. So and that really took me, yeah. I think I felt like he was maybe more mature as a, a young man and having been in the service and I think I was just basically impressed. And he was a pretty good looking guy too. So that played a big part. He's heard them. <laughs> but she was engaged, so um, I didn't think much about it. But uh, she'd got disengaged, and boy, that didn't take me long to kind of, kind of step in and uh, court that girl, and we ended up getting married. We had our first date on Easter Sunday that year. And not too long after that, he went to the church office where um, my mother, Hazel Stewart, was working as the secretary. And he told her that uh, he was asking for permission to ask me to marry him. And so that's, that's what he did the next time we were together, he proposed. It was like we just belonged together. In, we were married there in Wichita at the church we were going to by the, the pastor then. And then after we were married, we became part of the, the youth sponsors. So we were still very engaged in the Christian activities at the church. Are you in your wedding gown? Mm -hmm. Oh, I was really... I was really impressed. 
Yeah, it's like looking at our new eyes. After we got married, we decided we we're going to take a honeymoon in Colorado. So we drove out there and uh, went down to the Royal Gorge, where it's a very fast stream. And uh, Dolores went out and sat on a rock, and I took a picture of her. It's one of my favorite pictures of the of our honeymoon. By the way, that was a slide for the young people in the crowd. <laughs> like how we used to take pictures. So 1959, Dad becomes an aeronautical engineer during one of the most influential decades in human history. Are you sure? First man to walk on the moon. That'd be something. Requiring so many technological developments. We're gonna have to start from scratch. Only after we master these tasks do we consider trying to land on the moon. Neil, if this flight is successful, you'll go down in history. What kind of thoughts do you have about that? We're planning on the flight being successful. Damn, that is a big mother. It'll go up like a half kiloton A-bomb if it blows. The vehicle's not safe. We need to fail down here so we don't fail up there. This isn't just another trip, Neil. You're not just going to work. Do you think you're coming back? There are risks, but we have every intention of coming back. Somebody got a Swiss Army knife? Swiss Army knife? Are you kidding me? Here we go. Six, five, four, three, two. Do you question whether the program's worth the cost in money and in lives? down here and you look up and you don't think about it too much but space exploration changes your perception and it allows us to see things that we should have seen a long time ago we have serious problems we've got this under control you're a bunch of boys you don't have anything under control When I was in University of Wichita, I always looked for some place to work during the summertime. One year I worked for the Cessna Company, and the last senior year I worked for the Boeing Company. And uh, I really enjoyed that because they had a lot more opportunities of, of different kinds of aerodynamics. And so after I graduated, it was kind of a natural thing to apply and they offered me a position there in the aeronautical department. So uh, I was glad to get back working with Boeing. After I'd been there a couple of years, they were going to start downsizing the aeronautical section of the, of the B-52 I was working on. They didn't totally eliminate it, but they said, well, will you give choices between an assignment in Seattle, Washington, or Apollo in Huntsville, Alabama. And I talked to several people. We didn't like Seattle. <laughs> so we decided to accept the position in Huntsville, Alabama. And that's how I got on the Apollo program. At the very beginning, that was 1963. And they were just forming all of the engineers they needed to do the job. Well, this is the overall Apollo program, the designing phases it was not a specific mission as yet, but 
uh, Boeing had several different programs. One was to build the, the first stage of the Apollo, which is this particular unit here, in Michu, Louisiana. And the other was, the program was to integrate the whole aspect of the entire vehicle and do the trajectory planning to fly to the moon. And that was the part of I was involved in. And so that was a different kind of um, program because here I worked in aerodynamics and this now became astrodynamics, the study of flight in space. So I had a lot to learn, but uh, it was a very rewarding program. It was kind of mind-boggling because I didn't know anything about space flight. But when I went to Huntsville and we got started, it was kind of interesting. We really didn't have any computers then. I was using my slide rule to calculate a lot of the things. But it didn't take long to build up a big uh, array of computers and start flying trajectories going from launch to Earth orbit and then into the translunar trajectory. Part of the development uh, was a, to be a successful trajectory going from Earth launch to the moon. And to do that, you had to, we had to build a computer program that simulated all parts of the launch vehicle, not only from liftoff, but also flying up through the atmosphere and up into parking orbit. Because when we flew that mission, we then could give the commands to put into the launch vehicle to tell it to fly that very trajectory. That's what we, I worked in a group, worked on for several years to develop that capability. We didn't know a lot about the vehicle itself. After it got out of the pad, it got loaded with fuel. We didn't know precisely how much it weighed. And uh, we didn't know precisely of those wind engines were going to produce, so we didn't know precisely the amount of thrust. So we had to estimate a lot of those and uh, then fly what we thought was a, like a cone of uncertainty. And, and when you got up to the point where the engines cut off, we had to hope that we were close to that, but then we could calculate it and see how well we did. But yeah, there's a lot of the uncertainties about the mission itself. I, while I worked for the Boeing Company, I started writing technical papers about uh, the guidance program and the trajectories. And so those technical papers I wrote, I would go present them at different aeronautical societies. And one of the programs, uh, Buzz Aldrin was there. And uh, I, I talked to him later and he signed my speaker's card. They hadn't gone to the moon as yet, but they were being planned for Apollo 11. And so uh, that was good. And later on, Alan Bean, who was the artist, did a tremendous book about his mission to the moon. And uh, I bought the book and he autographed that. So he says, thanks Alan for the good trajectory. And so I met two or three I got kind of close to. I was kind of awestruck, of course, that I would meet them personally. So it was pretty rewarding. I was reading in uh, my Apollo Roll of Honor book, they said they had 4,000 companies that helped them put that together. Much of us engineers were kind of awestruck that it really worked. We just sat down there and listened to the whole thing, and we of course had lots of things to celebrate about, not only for the end, but the intermediate points that we were targeting for to make sure that we did everything correctly. To put it all together in a stack and to integrate that, uh, to make sure all the systems work together and it would uh, complete, be able to complete that mission. 
to me, still, is my Margaret. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. So at this point in Dad's career, well, yeah. after we he has uh, another defining the moment. And the second mission is it become evident they're all there is, the is putting man on the moon. To wind down. <laughs> and so I started listening to the Lord, and He had me ask my question: Well, how important was that in terms of eternity? And I had admit, well, it was important, but in terms of eternity. It's not that important. The only things important to an eternity are men's souls. And so that started me to thinking about changing from an engineer role to a, a missionary kind of role. So I put this up, and I didn't have the official letter, but I do recall Dad saying that... Um, he appreciated and valued his time at NASA, but he felt like uh, the future of mankind no longer existed in the exploration of space, but rather than the exploration of man's souls. So this is the graph, and I found this interesting. I hate to show a pointer here, but this is the gra graph originally ended over here at where he met mom. And you can see Lifeline, of course, Mike and I end up here. He puts that right next to getting his pilot's license, so we know, you know, what was really more important to him. <laughs> but this, this peak up during the whole Apollo missions, right, going up, and this other defining moment that he had, uh, as I, I found very interesting that at the peak of this, where he asked, is that all there is? And he started asking that question. There, there's this drop in, in the line where they, he and mom were both were looking for God's will in their life. And I think it was the uncertainty of that that became a part of that frustration and decline. Well, I came home after I was thinking about that, and I told her I thought the Lord was asking us to go into full-time mission work, and it's the first time in her life she was speechless. I think as an approach, I was uh, thrilled at the idea that the Lord may have called us into something special for us. But on the other hand, I had married an engineer. I didn't marry a missionary, and so it was hard to put all of that together. Eventually, we talked and shared our thoughts and feelings, and we finally came to a mutual agreement that we'd start looking at different kinds of organizations or missions to find out where, our, where the Lord would be leading us. I don't, want, I don't want to go too far, but one of the things that got us in was, was reading an article about the head of Wycliffe Bible Translators. And that's what got us started. And as we started looking at different organizations, we realized that a lot of our possessions, nice home, sports car, and a boat, would probably have to go by the wayside. So that was a big decision. And the idea of losing everything that I had put together as a, a married, you know, a mother and so forth, um, it was very difficult at that time because I still wanted those things. Uh, I, I wanted that house. I mean, that's, that was me, I thought. We, just, we thought we had our life, and we found out we weren't quite there yet. Well, I'm sure they didn't really realize what was going on. They just saw their things disappearing, but they were kind of excited too as we talked about the future. Well, I think it's a change of lifestyle, being willing to get by on less, but realizing more what your purpose in life is, so it's a bigger picture. In a way, it was kind of freeing because we didn't have to keep up with everybody. 
It's just a matter of letting go. Uh, jungle camp was uh, seven weeks in main base where we lived in the hut and another seven weeks out, uh, more out into the jungle, 14 weeks total. Each one of us had a duffel bag. And that's all we could take, stuff for the clothes and our cooking gear. And then we drove from Huntsville, Alabama, down through Houston, through the Laredo, and down into Mexico, to Mexico City, where we met with all of the other families that were going to jungle camp. Then we drove from Mexico City to uh, Las Casas. And there we left our car and we flew by Missionary Fellowship from there over into the base is Yasho Quintala. Oh. <laughs> and that's a Celta language for a base by the river. It's way in the south of Mexico, next to the Guatemala border. It was called San Cristobal de las Casas. And first you go to a main base where you live in thatched huts, but there's a number of families that are going to do the same thing with you. You eat in one dining room, and you take classes together, you go hikes together. So it's kind of a, a family kind of thing. One of the classes we had to learn is how to float and swim down stream on that, on that lake without, and going through rapids. We had Indian canoes. Dollar kind of had some difficulty doing that. But we had a good time. I hit my tailbone, is what I did. <laughs> Translators, the ones that go into the villages, are the only medical help those people have. No doctors, nurses, unless they happen to be a trained nurse. We had to practice on the, for the native people. They liked those shots because they thought they were uh, almost like magic. It just killed me the day I had to give a shot because that lady's arm was so tough, her skin was so tough that the needle just bounced off of her arm. And I thought, oh, I'm hurting this lady. I just could hardly stand it. But their thinking was, if it didn't hurt, it wasn't a good shot. It wasn't a good shot. Hey, why did you have to ride horses? Well, um, some of our hikes required like maybe 20 miles and so we would use horses part of the time and walk part of the time. And mules. And they used mules and I hated those mules and I said I'd rather walk. <laughs> so I got off and walked and I let a friend of mine ride my mule. They they went occasionally. And uh, some of they went with us on what was called an overnight where we'd go off, take our jungle hammock. We were taught how to hang up a jungle hammock that has mosquito net on it. And uh, the boys had to hang there, and we had to cook on the trail. So that overnight was quite an adventure. But then beyond that, they went to see, how would you do as a family independent from that? And then everybody went to the advance base for six more weeks, and it was just further out in the country, out in the jungle training. You didn't have to earn it. Everybody went from one to the other, and everybody got out of the jungle camp at the same time. Then we went to an advanced base, so they flew us to another location in the jungle. The strip was kind of uphill, and they had to come in really tight and come back down. Uh, we had unload. They would go back up the hill and then fly out. And we had to build our own house and set up and live as an individual family. But then we still got together and did things as a group. Years ago, they used to use a lot of poles and thatching, but they got to where it was stripping the jungle, so they gave us plastic sheets to cover to make an enclosed structure. We got Chris situated in his hammock. It was not an old, it's a different hammock. It was like what they used for military in Vietnam. And what I had Chris, he didn't have what's called a stabilizer bar rigged up right, so he completely flipped over 
yeah, upside sleeping, down. Uh, sleeping in the top. So fortunately, he didn't fall out. After the, uh, we got the house put together, Chris and Mike had one room, bunk beds, and we had another one, and then we had a front part, which was kind of like a dining area. They did allocate us a certain amount of food, and we had to be wise about using that because if you ran out, you're out. So a lot of people ate up some of the good stuff first, then they didn't have what they needed. They had one thing that would come through your house called army ants, and they'd just come marching through, cleaning everything out, but they were down on the ground. We cooked a large snake that was captured and we uh, skinned it, and we pressure cooked a lot of our food. So we were pressure cooking him, and a lot of white meat was pretty good. One of the programs of the uh, advanced base was there you had to find something to eat. And one of the things I found was a great big turtle. So I stabbed him with my machete, and I brought him back to camp, and I cooked him, and it was pretty good. But my mistake was, <clears throat> I kept what was left over the next morning and uh, tried to cook it, and it ended up, it wasn't a wise thing to do, because like I got sick. <laughs> no refrigeration, of course. Yeah. We boiled our own water. So we took it out of the river and then boiled it over our stove, become good drinking water. We didn't usually have much trouble with heating because of the weather conditions down there. Uh, you could have, on a rainy day, it could be pretty chilly. But our cooking stove was, it was like a mountain made out of mud. And then it had, an, uh, we put a, a can in the back of that that acted as a stove pipe. Uh, we had a, an iron plate just plain, that sat on top of that opening and then you put your wood in underneath and it got as hot as a stove that you'd turn on. We had outhouses that were outside of our uh, group of uh, huts that we lived in and they were, you know, they were made out of mud and had the thatched roof also. But we had a, a shower hut and each person that wanted to wash hair or take a shower would fill a, a bucket with water and that bucket had we had a thing that you screwed into the bottom of the bucket that looked like a shower head and you just let you, you had the water that was in the bucket but we also went swimming every day so for a lot of us we just soaked down and washed off in a the river and there were two main languages there one was called Seltal and they had a lot of Christian because early work Done. But there was one that was a very different. It's called the Lock and Don't Indian. And the men wore long gowns and let their hair grow long. And so they were very different. The ladies wear bright colors, basically. Well, the men do too. They wear the serapes and they carried a purse too. The men did? Yes. Did that influence you to grow your hair long? I <laughs> know. <laughs> we had. Um, villages not very far from us actually and they would come into town into where we were and sell uh, produce eggs and whatever to help s sustain the food that we were allotted while we were there part of our jungle camp orientation was coming to mexico city and we were there a number of days and they were giving us some orientation We had, after jungle camp, we had to drive back to Mexico City. And the directors there started looking at somebody to come in and manage the publication department. And so when we went there, they asked me if we would be willing to come back to Mexico and take on that job. It was out to one edge between Mexico City and Cuernavaca. But it was all city. We had uh, buildings. It was there were brick. It was right at the edge of the city, actually. So we never did live in the, we didn't go to a jungle assignment. It was kind of a compound where all the missionaries 
that worked in Mexico on the offices, as well as translators would come in and stay for a while. They'd be within that enclosure. But with everything, we had nice apartments, electricity and water, all of the basics. We called it our concrete jungle. Me being the woman in the family, I, I was probably very thankful. I thought we, were, we really had a nice place to stay. And after staying about three months in a mud hut, I felt lucky that that's where our first assignment would be. We worked on learning the Spanish language, but we weren't in a teaching role. I helped in the library that we had there. It's quite a, an extensive library for the translators and for all of it. And Al was head of, of the, the, the printing department, which he'd never done before, but that was what they needed when we got out of jungle camp. Well, our primary role when we got to Mexico's assignment was to produce materials for the Indian languages for the translator. He would learn their language, develop an alphabet, learn their language, and then teach them how to read because they were illiterate. He would develop literacy materials. We would print that, and he'd take it back out and use it in a teaching role. But he's also, when he developed scriptures, he'd generally go book by book in the New Testament, translate that, take it back out, try it, see how it worked, and through an iterative revision before they considered it a done book, then he'd keep going through all of the books of the New Testament that way before they put together a whole New Testament. And we would print those materials for him. Well, there was a book of translators that worked with the Lock and Dones. They'd been working with them about 20 years. And the uh, Lock and Dones are very suspicious people. And uh, after we left Jungle Camp, we heard the story that they finally started trusting Phil. And they said, you know, all these years, we didn't know why you wanted to learn our language. So we were feeding you wrong information. The language you thought you learned isn't really a language. And so they, he had to start all over. He, he thought he had given up a lot of the scriptures given to him, but he had to rewrite all of that. And as the outcome, they turned a lot of their lives over to him because they trusted him. And uh, one of the things at the center no matter where you were, they had Sunday night services where you'd come together, sing and pray, and share time, and just develop a real closeness. It was special. One of the things difficult when we came back to live in Duncanville some of the churches, we have a number of churches that support us, but their take was, well, you're not on the field anymore, you're not a missionary, so we can't support you. So they stopped their giving. We learned a lot there, from different from our U.S. standard of living to living on a different standard. Learning to trust the Lord, because we didn't have any income as a salary. We had to trust on him for people to make gifts to us. One of the interesting things when we got ready to leave, I had some friends within the Boeing Company. One was a uh, Catholic couple, and they thought so much of what we were doing. They supported us financially all, all the time we were there. And that was something more than some of our family didn't do. Well, when we came back from Mexico, we were still part of the organization. Al just had a different position. And yes, we moved to Duncanville, Texas, and uh, had our own house. We had to keep living on the giving of, of our um, supporters for years after we came back until we left 
Wycliffe entirely. The longer we were in the United States, the more our income dropped. And we just felt like we, that was the Lord telling us, now it's time to leave. When we did have to leave, I didn't want to because I felt disappointed that they didn't find another position for us. It was in a situation where you thought, well, they must, maybe they didn't care anything about what we did because they just kind of left us out on the fringes because they didn't have another assignment for us yet after all those years. I still missed the um, what you have when you're not a missionary. I missed the things. Being a woman, I guess, I missed having those things. I missed having what I thought was enough money to live on and not having to wait every month to see how much money we'd have to live on. Plus, there were guys that I worked with uh, back on a Wahala program. They were on this new program called International Space Station. And I talked to them, they said, hey, we got a job for you, come back. Well, after 18 years, you're obsolete. So I felt like that, okay. that was our, our answer. I missed it really very much when we first came back after we left Wycliffe. I went through a period of depression because I couldn't understand why I was there, where my heart was back with the mission. And a friend of mine was a uh, psychologist. He says, well, it's like you're going through a divorce. One thing was that the other missionaries understood us. Some of our, like we said earlier, some of our own family didn't understand us. They just couldn't put that all together. But the other missionary people, everybody took care of everybody and they understood everything. They understood the difficulties and, because they'd been through it too. Do your homework and then Say, be sensitive to what the Lord brings to you. And try not to run ahead of yourself. Just like the scripture we, we uh, took for ourselves. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lead on your own understanding. But walk close to Him. I felt like some I made some bad decisions along the way, mistakes. But I guess that's part of life. You always look back and think, well, I could have done a better job. But we felt like we did what the Lord wanted us to do. So in my heart, I still have a belief that I'd rather be back there. So just to make a note that uh, even though they left Wycliffe and, and Dad went back to Boeing, to work on the space program, you can see that Wycliffe still continues today to translate the Bible in multiple languages around the world. Just going back to this lifeline real quick, I just found it fascinating that, you know, I, I can imagine the drop, you know, that we talked about. This ends up being jungle camp as a highlight, obviously, because Dad was having a lot of fun in the jungle until he ate that stupid turtle. Um, <laughs> Mom was having a great time. What she didn't tell you in that story was that she broke her tailbone because the canoe flipped over and she fell out of the river and hit a rock. So it wasn't just as simple as <laughs> her tailbone. But um, so the assignment, so, so jungle camp being here as a, you know, uh, and then the assignment to Mexico City picks back up again because after jungle camp, what happened is we ended up going back to Huntsville, Alabama for about six months and waited, right, until we got an assignment. We got assigned to Mexico and then things started getting better uh, at that point. So as you look at this, I just think, gee, dad must have felt like that kid in the beginning just <laughs> walloped every time he turned around, right, up and down, up and down. And so as this... Um, Assignment in Mexico City gets up. Uh, you can see down here in the bottom, I didn't really highlight, but here's the cities, right? Huntsville, Alabama, Chiapas, Mexico. There's Duncanville right here. 
And so this peak up here was going fine until we ended up the support dropped to 50%, which is what Dad was just talking about. So it basically meant that, you know, we were below the poverty line. And so they made a decision for Dad to go back to Boeing uh, about here. But it was interesting because this whole section from here all the way till he retires is essentially working on the International Space Station, which you think, wow, that would be great. But Dad was struggling with that. I mean, this is his own graph. I didn't draw this, right? Feeling of hopeless depression. I think it was leaving the missions. It was coming back into a world some 25 years later that changed. You know, back in the 60s, there were few if no women in engineering, and that changed a lot. And so uh, I think one comment he made to me one day was that working for the missions, you trusted everybody. In today's world, it was backstabbing and everybody's trying to get ahead of each other, which he really struggled with, I think. And so at the end of this lifeline, Dad's last entry was after retirement. They were in Houston, and he entered it here where they moved to Tyler. And so it continued on for a number of years, and I'll take a stab at it later, and you can see some of the things that happened in life. But I, it, after this, I thought, I'm going to go do this for where I'm at in life. It's, it's an interesting way to see yourself. And so I just want, Dad really didn't talk much about this. I think in Tori's interviews, we didn't get to the space station. But I, I did want to emphasize that the Dad did know the crew of the Columbia um, and that the impacts that the space station have and are still having and will have for decades to come you know, is the conduct, you know, doing a lot of space uh, in, in uh, science and space that can't be done on Earth. And so they're still having numerous breakthroughs through all this. And the beauty of it was that when Dad retired, it was about the time they finished uh, the design and they started flying missions up and started assembling it. So for the next 20 years, he got to sit and watch it being assembled uh, and put together, which is kind of cool. And this was a plaque that they gave him and a bunch of uh, his... So at the tail end of his career, he was still impacting influence space travel. So I thought I'd just take this moment <laughs> to talk about just the funny parts of Dad uh, and his love for motorcycles and cars and other things. And of course, he bought us a mini bike. I, I still couldn't reach the ground on that. So, you know, I always had to have Big Brother help me out. We had to really figure out how to get the, all the neighbors on the mini bike, and of course, mom, this is one of those things that she'd really love to do, not. <laughs> she'd sit on it, but she wouldn't actually drive it by herself, which influenced my first bike, but the problem was I couldn't ever ride it because mom and dad were too busy going out on it all the time. <laughs> dad, I still can't believe this picture. I, I found this for the first time digging around. This is a, basically a Harley Davidson going up the side of a hill, and I'm thinking, well, now that Bob tells his story, I think, okay. I could see Dad doing that. But that's influenced uh, and had impacts on myself. I've now got a bike that I ride through Colorado and off-road, uh, as well as Mike and Doreen, and they, they ride together. And so, so that's impacted a lot about just our family in general. And, of course, here's Dad. He, he jokingly told me one day, he says, hey, if your mom goes before me, I'm going to ride a motorcycle and ride it to California like I used to. I said, okay, Dad. Sure. <laughs> For dad, everything was, I just had to modify it. And I look at this picture and I'm like, oh, you gotta be kidding me, did that really work? I can't imagine he backed up. <laughs> the other funny story, I think, is when we were pulling an engine out of an old Volvo, he strapped a, a hoist up to the garage ceiling and I'm thinking, I'm not sure this is gonna hold dad. We start yanking it up and we hear a crack. He goes, hmm, maybe we ought to modify that. So I went up and he went to the attic and added a couple of big steel pipes, wrapped the chain around it, and we hoisted it up. And I'm like, oh, Mom, you have no idea how close it was that you didn't have a house. <laughs> Room thinks that uh, if you don't ask somebody the right question, you're never going to know the answer about a family member or loved one or especially a parent. Start asking now, I'm telling you. There's two things I found out about Dad. 
mom knows, one mom may not know. So I'm not sure if she's going to hit me after this or not. One of the Ed, you were working in Houston, right? Yeah. You worked on the rockets for the Apollo missions, right? Yeah. Wasn't Walter Von Braun there working on it? Yeah. Did you work with him? Oh, yeah. We worked together. Like, when are you going to tell us that? Well, when you ask the right question. So obviously they worked together. The other one was, he was actually a competitive ballroom dancer. Now, mom, don't ask me when this was. I assume it was before he met you. This was a picture of him. But I thought that was interesting to learn. So again, ask a question. You don't know until you ask. For some of you in the room, especially Champion Cove family over there, they know dad for his 59 MGA, which apparently he keeps being convinced to give people rides to go get ice cream. Part of our time when I was in the pilot program, we got into restoring a car, you know, the British sports car, and rebuilding that and restoring it we kind of worked as a team. Here are two pictures of what it looked like when we bought it. It was in boxes and, and trash cans because it had all been disassembled. And we wanted a second car. We didn't know anything about restoring, but I, I was a good mechanic. I thought, well, I can put that together. But when we got into it, we found that that was a big job. I would find parts, and I'd say, where does this go? She would look up in some of the manuals, find out where it went, and then I would install it. So there's what it looked like when we finished it after eight years. And, and then pictures of different events where we went to compete, and we won a lot of trophies with it. So it's been a fun car. And by the, and by the way, the MG's out there, but the keys aren't in it, so let me try to drive it off. But do go take a look. because dad made that wooden piece that we could sew. A gift from his great-grandchildren. But we really didn't think he'd ever put it on. Uh, Bob, you didn't see this one coming, but... <laughs> Mia decided she was vegetarian after this. She didn't, still doesn't like fish to this day.
Mike found an artist to do this for us, which that drawing is over here on the right, if you want to take a closer look. It turned out great. So we get to the end of Dad's lifeline, and again, I took a shot after essentially his last entry here, uh, moving to Tyler. And for the most part, the lifeline continues on average, you know, and things are going well. And then two years ago, he has to go in for surgery and ended up being in the hospital 69, 70 days. And we thought for sure we were going to lose him. And I think he was ready to give up. But he didn't. And the beauty of that, you can see, is that the following year we had Thanksgiving. We took a river cruise up to Oregon. They had planned a trip to Europe to do a river cruise, and so... They thought, well, this is the next best thing, and it's beautiful up there if you haven't been. It's the Red River and, Bob, what was the other river? The Columbia River, which basically, to do this cruise, you go in reverse what Lewis and Clark did, which is pretty cool, um, to the Snake River. So uh, I encourage you all, if you haven't done it, it's a beautiful trip, seven days. And the funniest thing is Dad went to a little... Uh, museum that had a bunch of uh, air, uh, airplanes in it, and he bought this hat. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, I saw that hat somewhere before, and if he'd pulled the ears down on this one, it'd be the exact same hat, I think. <laughs> 80 years later. Pretty funny. Reconnected with uh, Bob and Diana and all the family who live up in, in the Portland area, so that was awesome that he got to see them again. And they celebrate, sorry mom, I thought it was 64. It was 65th anniversary last September? You have to, th should I get my calculator out? Yeah. Okay. So they celebrated that, and this is Reunion Tower, just last September. And then we got to celebrate Christmas as well. So I'll leave this in closing for my part. To say always hug those that you love every time. Like it's the last time. And tell them you love them. Because you just never know if you'll see them again. Brandon, you're up. There we go. <laughs> so over the last few months, um, been doing a lot of work on the MG with Grandpa. He just kept finding more and more assignments to do. Every time I come over, it's like, okay, we got to take off this tire, got to take off that tire, got to do this, got to do that. And I don't know. He's just loving working on the car. Well, after we'd get it put back together, we'd go out for a test drive. You know, Grandpa was always wearing one of these hats with a bunch of buttons on it. Always kept it in the car. Well, this particular day, uh, there was no hat, and he made me drive. Well, the closest thing nearby was uh, this beautiful picture that we got right here, and that is Grandma's hat with a little bonnet on it. 
he needed a hat on his head, so I uh, had to take a picture of him while we were out for a little joyride. Anyways, I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, right. Um, then, okay, so after this, I'm going to sing a little song, but it's kind of funny because one of the lines uh, in the song is about winning, uh, and Bob was making a little joke about playing chess earlier. He actually let you win a game? <laughs> he did not ever let any of us win anything, so it's kind of funny. Uh, Mia, you want to come join me? Ready for you 
memory. Wherever you are, Grandpa, just remember that we love you. Thank you. I wasn't going to say anything about playing chess, but since everybody else is, I did, in fact, beat Dad one time at chess. And it was like, yes! <laughs> and then I looked across the board at Dad, and he was still studying the board like he was going like, there's no way my boy just beat me at chess. He's, he's looking at it in disbelief. I never won another game. <laughs> Dad shellacked me. No mercy. So I was going to share some stories and pictures about Dad, but obviously you've seen the whole, whole shebang. And uh, so I'm just going to cut straight to this. Uh, a little disclaimer, if I start to cry, it's not because I'm emotional. It's because currently I'm scared to death standing up here in front of all of you guys. <laughs> so uh, bear with me, please. I blame it on allergies. Um, yeah, allergies. So, as you well know, Mom and Dad were devout Christians, and, and, uh, and you've seen all the reasons why. Um, so, obviously, Chris and I grew up going to church. Went to church Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesdays, sometimes on Saturdays. We'd go to church potlucks. You ever been to a potluck? Potlucks are awesome. One of my favorite ones were at the Rudman's house. It was a mile of tables, starting with meat, everything all the way down to the dessert table. Mom always started at the dessert table, though. I promise you that. So uh, she still does. Um, so during all those years, we were growing up in, in church and, and, and throughout all the years. And maybe this is just me. You, you kind of learn that when someone passes, the proper thing to say is they're in a better place. So it just kind of comes, it just rolls off your tongue without even really giving it any, any thought, at least it did for me. It was just what you said. Well, a couple days after Dad had passed, I got a call from a good friend. And during the conversation, they mentioned, they did say, um, um, you know, feel comfort in the fact that he's in a better place. And it was all of a sudden, it was just like, like somebody just poured a cold bucket of water on my head. And I was like, wow, he really is in a better place. So I started thinking, how wonderful must that be? To actually get to go and experience heaven for yourself. I mean, so I started thinking, uh, well, I got a little bit ahead of myself there, but. So anyways, I, I was just letting those feelings all soak in, and, and, and obviously we can't all fathom the reality in the of what heaven is, is really like and all about. And then all of a sudden I got this feeling, hey, dad knows, dad's there, he knows. And uh, that brought a lot of comfort to me. And uh, the next thing that came to my mind, some of you guys might recognize some of this, I just changed them to fit, dad. I was wondering, how dad reacted when he was surrounded by your glory. What did dad's heart feel? Did dad dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Did dad stand in your presence or to his knees did he fall? Did dad sing hallelujah or was he able to speak at all? We'll never know. We can only imagine until it's our turn. So as all I can say is dad knows he's there.
I love you, Dad. I'll see you soon. Thank all of you guys for coming and sharing this story with us. I think we got some food somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Before I close in prayer, Mike, do you preach? Say, do you preach? No. Yeah. He does now. Maybe, maybe you ought to look into that. I can tell that uh, Al lived a full life and did, I believe, everything that God called him to do. Let's close in prayer. Father, we know that you are the giver of life. Your word tells us over and over. I thank you that you allowed Al to be in our presence the number of years that he was. I thank you, Father, for the impact that he has had on his family. God, I ask that this family be as committed to what you have called them to do as Al was to the calling you had upon his life. God, I ask that you draw this family even closer together than they are. And Lord, if there be any in this family or friends that are here, that do not know you as Lord and Savior. I ask God that through this service, through Al and his commitment to you, that they'll be drawn to you. God, I know that there are several that travel long distance to get here. God, I ask that you place obedient guardian angels with them as they go to their various homes protect them, keep them safe. And Lord, we just give you all the praise and all of the glory. And we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So in closing, there is uh, food just across the hall. And um, so please feel free to hang around and visit with family. I'll finish this up. Oh, that was a closing prayer. And Al's great adventure. And it seems to me that if I was to get a call from Dad this morning, right now, Dad, he's calling. He's calling from Heaven's Lake. You're not going to believe how big the bass are. They got joined Bass Masters. Well done, Dad. Was there music that was supposed to be playing with this, I think? Jonathan, is there a clip? Okay. That's okay. You can just start the... Um, you are low. Yeah. Thanks again, everybody. You bring I appreciate light you coming. To the darkness you give hope. This is just playing after music. You restore every heart that Thank you. Is I appreciate that. You know, uh, uh, I learned more about Al in this short time.